Hi and welcome to Dark Rain True Crime Channel, my name is Rachel, and today we'll be telling the story of the American serial killer, Arthur Shawcross, who was also known as the Genesee River Killer. The story starts in a rundown area of New York, called Watertown, a small town which was built around the paper-making industry, a place which was also known as the coldest place in the USA. It was in Watertown that Mary and Peter Blake lived, with their nine children. The Blakes didn't have a lot of money, and lived quite a simple life, sometimes resorting to petty crime, leading them to have the odd skirmish with police. When Mary arrived home from playing bingo on Sunday 7 May 1972, she was told that her son Jack, had not returned home. Jack was a good boy, he was different to the other kids, and would always be home on time. Mary was really worried, although it was likely that he'd just gone fishing at the polluted Black River, which ran through the town. Mary's biggest fear, was that he had gone with the creepy guy he sometimes sold worms to, the creepy guy he once brought to the house, they called him Arthur. Mary waited until midnight before calling police, she told them of her concerns about the man called Arthur, and that he lived at the nearby Cloverdale apartments. Police officers went to the apartments, closely followed by Mary, and they managed to locate the tenant's list. From there they were soon knocking on the door of apartment 233. The home of Arthur Shawcross. Mary screamed at Arthur, demanding to know where her son was. Arthur told Mary and the police, that he'd seen the boy playing earlier in the afternoon, but had not seen him since. Mary wasn't convinced, she was sure he was somehow involved with her son's disappearance, but with no evidence, police said there was nothing they could do. The frantic mother organized search parties every day for weeks, but her son was nowhere to be found. A few months later, on Labor Day weekend at the beginning of September 1972, Stan Fisher and his friend Helen Hill, along with her two daughters, eight-year-old Karen, and three-year-old Chrissy, headed up to Watertown. They were visiting Watertown to see relatives, Linda and Dick Miles, who lived just around the corner from Mary Blake. On the Saturday morning after they had arrived, Helen was busy getting herself ready for the day, while eight-year-old Karen, played outside. It was not until around 2 p.m. that Helen realized she had not seen her daughter for quite some time, so along with Linda Miles they went and searched for her. The search was fruitless, and at 6.15 p.m. they contacted police. Police got reports from the public, seeing the young girl playing near the Iron Bridge, so this became the focus area of their search. Shortly after 9 p.m., after searching the Iron Bridge area, near a sewage pipe they found the body of a young girl, lying face down in the water, she was naked from the waist down and covered with paving slabs. It was obvious that the young girl had been violated in the worst possible way, and evident that she had been strangled with her own clothing. But the police fucked up the investigation, no blood typing was done, no semen was taken from her body, and the temperature of the body was not taken to establish the approximate time of death. By not doing all of these tests, it would be so much harder to build a case against whoever had murdered little Karen. The news about the murder soon reached Mary Blake, and she knew exactly where police should be looking, the apartment of Arthur Shawcross. Since young Jack's disappearance, Shawcross had been arrested by police for inappropriately touching a six-year-old child, so police brought him in for questioning. Questioning went on throughout the night, and Shawcross told police that he was helping a neighbor at the time Karen went missing. But a group of girls seen a man dressed in shorts and a t-shirt, coming out of the woods near the bridge where Karen was found, the clothing described by the girls, were found in Shawcross's laundry basket. They also described the bike the man was on, with fishing rods hanging off the back, Shawcross had exactly the same bike, and fishing rods. It was after this evidence was put to him, that he quietly whispered, I must have done it, but I don't actually remember doing it. This partial confession was enough to hold Shawcross for the murder of Karen, but police knew he had something to do with Jack Blake's disappearance, and continued to question him and try to get him to reveal where the body was located. After watching the news on TV, covering the disappearance of Jack and murder of Karen, a local motel owner remembers a man fitting Shawcross's description, coming out of woods behind the motel. He contacted police who searched the area, and little Jack's body was discovered in a shallow grave, not far from the motel. 
Police would later get a full confession from this disgusting excuse for a human being. So who is Arthur Shawcross? Arthur John Shawcross was born on June 6, 1945, in Kittery, Maine, from parents Arthur Roy and Betty Shawcross. He was the oldest of four children, and when he was eight years old, the family upsticked and moved to Watertown, New York. He wasn't the brightest, these killers never are. And at school he was classed as borderline retarded, whatever that means. He was a frequent bedwetter, even into his teens he would go to school stinking of piss, which probably attributed to him becoming the school bully. He claims when he was seven years old, his mother performed a sex act on him, and during junior high school, he had sexual relations with his sister and his cousin. Lovely family. Shawcross dropped out of school at the age of 15, and spent most of his time out of work. He eventually found a girl who wasn't part of his family, and married at the age of 19. In April 1967 at the age of 21, he was drafted into the army, he divorced his wife before he left, and gave up the rights to his 18-month-old son, who he would never see again. He served one tour of duty with the 4th Infantry Division in Vietnam. Shawcross later boasted of combat exploits, such as beheading Vietnamese women, and nailing their heads to trees as a warning to the Viet Cong, and that he engaged in cannibalism, the truth of it though, was that he never served in a combat position. After his tour in Vietnam, he was stationed at Fort Sill, in Lawton, Oklahoma, where he met his second wife Linda. Linda experienced several aspects of his disturbing behavior, especially his desire for starting fires. An army psychiatrist told her that Shawcross got sexual arousal from setting things ablaze. After his discharge from the army, Shawcross moved states with Linda from Oklahoma, to Clayton, New York. Linda would soon divorce him, after which he began committing crimes such as arson and burglary. Shawcross like most thieves, would end up getting caught, and ended up doing a five-year sentence for arson at the Auburn Correctional Facility. He was released after 22 months and returned home to Watertown, and married for a third time, which takes us back to the time of the murders of Jack and Karen. Even though the prosecutor's office had a confession from Shawcross, that's all they had on him, so unbelievably, the DA's office offered him a plea deal, where he would plead guilty to the manslaughter of Karen Hill, and all charges would be dropped against him for the murder of Jack Blake. In 1973, he would go on to be sentenced to just 25 years in prison for the manslaughter of Karen Hill. If the police had done their job properly, he would have gotten life without parole. After 14 years imprisonment, inexperienced prison staff and social workers, concluded that Shawcross was no longer dangerous, disregarding the warnings of psychiatrists who had assessed Shawcross as a schizoid psychopath. He was released on parole in April 1987. Serving just 14 years is an absolute disgrace, this fucking monster served seven years for killing each young child, and releasing him early, would result in the death of another 11 young women. After his release from prison, Shawcross had difficulty settling down, as neighbors would protest his presence, and employers would refuse to hire him. Shawcross moved around from place to place, but eventually his parole officer moved him and his girlfriend Rose into a transient hotel in Rochester, but failed to notify local authorities of this action. Another mistake that would ultimately lead to the deaths of many young women. In mid-October, Shawcross and Wally found more permanent lodgings at 241 Alexander Street in Rochester. Less than five months later, the first body was found, and authorities weren't even aware that Shawcross was living in the area. In March 1988, snow was still on the ground in the town of Rochester, and workers were picking out litter from the Salmon Creek in Northampton Park, when a worker hooked what he thought was a mannequin, when he pulled it to the bank, he realized it was a naked woman's body. It was the body of missing crack cocaine addict and prostitute, Dorothy Blackburn. She had horrific injuries which included bite marks to her vaginal area, and she was strangled to death. Another body was found on the 9th of September, the body of a woman had been placed into a garbage bag, and thrown into the Genesee River Gorge. She was too badly decomposed for a cause of death to be established, but a forensic anthropologist managed to build a facial reconstruction from her skull, plastic eyes, and a wig was put on the reconstruction and the resulting photo from it was given to the media. A man phoned and told police it looked like his daughter, and after tests were done, 
it was confirmed it was Anna Marie Stefan. Anna had looked after and cared for her disabled sister for years, before going off the rails and falling into the world of drugs and prostitution. Authorities were now aware of Shawcross living in Rochester, but to police he was a child killer, and they didn't connect him to the deaths of two prostitutes. Shawcross and Rose got married in 1989, he also had a mistress, Clara Neal, who would become his fourth wife in time. In October 1989, bodies were starting to be found along the gorge of the Genesee River, and in the Salmon Creek of Northampton Park. When the ID of missing girl Felicia Stevens was found in Northampton Park, police mounted an aerial search, and on the 3rd of January the helicopter spotted a corpse in the snow. But that wasn't all they saw. Alongside Route 31 where the body lay, was a grey Chevrolet car, it was a car that Shawcross's mistress had hired, while her car was in getting repaired. Beside the car was a man, apparently taking a leak, and as soon as he seen the helicopter hovering beside the body, he got back into his car and drove away. The helicopter followed it, and radioed a ground patrol to intercept the car. The grey Chevrolet came to a halt outside Wedgwood Nursing Home, where Shawcross's mistress Clara worked, and when police arrived, they found him inside the nursing home. They found out he had no driving license, he'd not held one since 1970, and when they checked his past, they realized they might have just caught their serial killer. The state police and Rochester Police Department argued over who was to interview the suspect, and after five hours they let him go for the night, the next day the interview started again, and after a few hours, Shawcross confessed to the murders. Since arriving in Rochester, Shawcross had killed 11 women. Dorothy Blackburn was his first victim, Shawcross claimed Dorothy bit his penis during oral sex, so he bit her back, then strangled her. Anna Marie Daly was found six months after Dorothy was discovered, she was pregnant at the time of her murder, Shawcross claimed he was having sex with Anna when some children appeared, and the prostitute refused to keep quiet, so he strangled her to death thinking it was a parole violation to be naked near children. Crazy Patty as she was known to friends, she was renowned for doing anything for drugs, her body was found in the river behind the YMCA, and a gold ring she always wore, was missing from her body. Shawcross had given the ring to his mistress Clara. Frances Brown was a high school dropout and a heroin addict, she had been asphyxiated, although Shawcross would later say he choked her with his penis during oral sex. Dorothy Keeler was another woman having an affair with Shawcross, he does well for an overweight ugly bloke. He said he clubbed the woman to death after she threatened to reveal their affair to his wife, he dumped her body in the river, later going back to it, cutting off her head and dumping her back in the river. Elizabeth Gibson was another prostitute, Shawcross claims he killed her because she tried to scratch him. June Clot was a homeless woman with learning disabilities, Shawcross claims that June asked him to have sex with her claiming to be a virgin, then said she was calling the police so he strangled her. He later went back to her body to check if her virgin story was true, then removed a portion of her genitals and ate it. Darlene Trippy was murdered by Shawcross when she questioned the size of his manhood, apparently he flew into a rage after being told he had a little willy, he would later show police where he dumped her body. Maria Welsh was so worried about the Rochester serial killer that she only worked in pairs but one night her friend went on another trick, leaving her alone. She was never seen again. Shawcross claimed he killed her after she tried to steal his wallet. June Cicero was picked up by Shawcross, who took her to an isolated area and attempted to have sex with her, before strangling her. This was done right under the noses of the investigating police, this time he dumped the body off a bridge over the Genesee River. Two days later he returned to the dump site with a small handsaw, he sliced the vagina from her frozen body and ate it. His final victim was another prostitute, named Felicia Stevens, he had strangled her and dumped her body near where he disposed of Jean Cicero and Dorothy Blackburn. On December 31, 1989, Felicia's blue jeans with her ID in the pocket, were found in Northampton Park. An aerial search found the body on January 3, it also spotted a vehicle cruising the area, and recorded its license number, tracing the plate back to Arthur's mistress Clara. In November 1990, Shawcross was tried for the 10 murders in Monroe County. The trial was televised and drew high ratings. Shawcross pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity, 
but the jury found him sane and guilty. The judge sentenced him to 250 years imprisonment. A few months later, Shawcross was taken to Wayne County to be tried for Elizabeth Gibson's murder. Rather than claim insanity this time, he just pleaded guilty and was given a life sentence. On the afternoon of November 10, 2008, 63-year-old Shawcross complained of a pain in his leg. He was taken to Albany Medical Center where he went into cardiac arrest, and died shortly after. He was pronounced dead at 9.50 p.m. It seems a lot of officials made grave errors of judgment, allowing this monster to go free after 14 years, especially after murdering two young children. People who do those sort of things, don't just change after 14 years, I'd love to know who was on that parole board that decided, yes, he's murdered two young children, but he's served 14 years and that's long enough, he's no longer a threat to society. Do you think child killers should be kept in jail for the rest of their natural life? If someone is capable of doing an unthinkable crime like Shawcross, then yes I think they should. Throw away the fucking key. Let me know what you think in the comments down below. Thanks for watching, please give the video a like if you found it interesting, and hit that subscribe button if you like this sort of content. See you in the next one.